Hello. In this screencast, I'm going to talk about a programming style in the analysis system called R, called parametric programming. My name is John Mount. I'm one of the authors, along with Dr. Nino Zimmel, of Practical Data Science with R. I'm a frequent contributor to the WinVector blog, a blog covering mathematics and statistical questions, and, of course, data science. I'm a principal consultant at WinVector LLC, a San Francisco-based data science consultancy and training organization. Among our products is the free library or package vTreat, which makes data preparation for predictive analytics safe and statistically sound and improves your modeling ability. Here's a little call out from Dimitri Larko saying, vTreat to the rescue. Thank you. WinVector LLC is also always looking for new consulting, training, and even speaking engagements. Please do reach out to us. For this talk, I will set up the terms of discussion, which are essentially standard or parametric calling conventions and non-standard evaluation or argument capture conventions. I will illustrate the great effort required to automate, wrap, or program over packages that prefer argument capture style. I'll end our, with our opinionated package solving the problem, Replier. All you need to remember is, please give Replier a try. It is already up on CRAN, the primary R software repository, and it has a lot of documentation and worked examples in the included vignettes. As I said, let's define our terms. Standard R parametric calling is what is going to be most familiar to most programmers in non-R environments. It's a calling convention where either values or references to values are made available to functions and programs. This preserves what is called referential transparency. That is, a calculation has the same semantics if a value replaces a variable. For instance, if x is referring to the value of 5, then x plus 1 and 5 plus 1 evaluate to the same number, 6. For non-standard calling or evaluation, values and variables are not equivalent. In R, this allows a number of effects. For instance, things like plot, even base plot, can snoop the actual names of arguments. And we can also use the facility to delay or avoid evaluating arguments at all. This is why experienced R programmers will be familiar with this notation, library ggplot2, which brings in the package named ggplot2 treating that as a string and not as a variable containing another value. What does non-standard evaluation buy us? Well, in the case of plots, it buys a fairly neat effect that the plot can snoop the variable names the user supplied and use them to automatically label the axes as shown. In the case of library or package loading, it essentially only saves us the writing of quotes which is not much of a saving and also violates several style guides in the use of packages. I myself prefer a strict, well-defined interface. This is illustrated in this fragment from WinVector Plots, another package we distribute. To build a scatter histogram of the iris data frame, we would say WinVector Plots, scatter hist, iris, where iris is the data frame in the first argument. We would then, with later arguments, say what is to be done. In this case, we're saying plot the sepal length and sepal width and title the plot. Notice that all further arguments are within quotes because we're using values, not name capture. This would allow us to program over wind vector plots, make many plots as we vary names of columns. Standard evaluation interfaces are already, in fact, easy to use, so you don't need the additional elegance of a non-standard interface in all cases. For instance, if our task, which we'll take as our example throughout this talk, is to take a small data frame with a single column x that has some missing or na values, and build a second advisory column saying which rows have such missing values, we can do this either in the non-standard form as shown in the left of the table where we set up the data frame, and then we use the dollar sign notation to produce a new column. Notice that we need to note both the name we intend for the new column and the name of the column we're calculating over to write this code. So this is good for ad hoc or one-off analyses where we're actually sitting in front of live data. In the standard or parametric form, the setup, which we show on the right, the setup is a little longer. We assume that we're supplied the name of the column we're calculating over, say C name. From that, we can even derive a name to land the result in, R name, which we build up by a paste. Then, once we have both the names of the columns we're calculating over, the code is equivalent to the dollar sign notation, except for we use the double square bracket notation. 
So there's really not a huge cost in assuming we only can use standard interfaces, the standard interfaces being easier to program over. Non-standard or capturing interfaces can be a lot more elegant. We take the same example. Once we've got the dproy library active, we can pipe the data D through the pipe, the percent arrow percent operator, into the mutate. And the mutate itself says form a new column called x is na as the calculation of which positions of the column named x are na. Again, this is a non-standard or capturing interface. As you can see, the variable names are free as they would be in a formula, and they're not in quotes or in parameters. However, the standard interfaces to dplyr are not what I would call fully first-class citizens, or they're certainly not convenient. Converting the dplyr pipe is actually quite difficult. Here we're illustrating three of the recommended methods. I don't expect you to read all this code, and it took me quite a while to debug it, read enough references, and get it to work. The first one is a lazy val interpreter, which is using a formula-like interface, but seems to have little control of where the name is landed, so we have to rename it and introduce a temporary name, which of course could collide with other names in our data frame. The second is a substitute method. And the last one is a val string. And in this one, essentially what we're doing is pasting the code or the source or the text of the code we wish to execute into a string and then using some of the evaluation rules to say that this string is then evaluated as if it had been code. What I'm saying is I refuse to accept that it is hard to automate operations over purely virtual objects like pipelines and data frames, both of which exist only in the computer. I mean, here's a robot automating the manipulation of a Rubik's Cube effortlessly. How do we make our work similarly effortless? In my opinion, the way we achieve that is by preferring parametric or standard interfaces. We would like to write code in a nice free um, value, sorry, value capture way, but we'd prefer that the people that supply packages or libraries for us take the extra effort to supply a standard interface so that we can then program over it easily. Standard interfaces are better for scripting and automation. They're easier to compose with each other. It's easy to pass the values of one standard interface to another. And it's easier to wrap or supply a function to perform a service if the services you are in fact using are using standard interfaces. This is because when you're writing a function or a library or a package, you're writing code before you have a hand on the actual data you can use. You may have practice data, but because you don't have the actual data, you may not know the column names or variable names that you're going to be required to work over when you're writing the code. To make the conversion of non-standard or capturing interfaces into more powerful or more programmable standard interfaces, our package replier supplies a method called let. Now let's work our original example yet again. In the top left, we have the original dplyr pipeline where the variable names were typed in when we typed in the pipeline. In the bottom right, we have the reapplier let parameterized version of this. Notice we can just essentially copy the entire dplyr pipeline into the let block. We merely change the names of the variables to stand in names. So we're using our name to stand in for the result, which we will later know is x is na, and we're using cname to stand in for the column we're calculating over, which we will later know is x. In a replier let block, the first line is called the alias, which binds the stand-in names to the actual names, or values, which are themselves carried as values. So you see the variable cname lowercase has an x, and the replier let block is saying cname capital is to be x throughout the next expression, where again, x is a value that might be different from run to run. A lot more can be found on this, in the replier package on CRAN, which has a number of vignettes and examples. What is replier let? It's essentially a macro facility plus immediate execution. It is derived from Gregory Warren's GTool string macro. It maps names to names. It's fundamentally different than tools that map names to bound values, such as substitute, attach, or with. Should you use replier let in your own code? In our view, yes. It converts non-standard evaluation interfaces into more powerful and reusable standard evaluation interfaces. It retains the elegance and ease of working 
over non-standard interfaces. You can write large dplyr pipelines as if you knew the variable names and then use let to substitute them in later at runtime. Now a strong alternative view is to build better tools on top of formula interfaces and use the increased power of manipulating these non-standard and formula interfaces with the lazy eval package. And that's written about here. As a bonus, let works over knitter or R markdown pages, especially parameterized ones. This was noticed by Jason Becker, and obviously his group is starting to use it as they've now slacked to each other, let is magic. The way this works is that markdown pages allow a YAML data block at the top. In this case, the YAML data block is denoted with three minus signs, and it's essentially saying the parameters are that the name function is bound to the name sign. When it comes time to execute, we can exploit that by telling Replier that the alias comes from parameters. Restrict to name assignments is just a convenience function supplied by Replier that moves out any value bindings, making the let block safer. Then the expression, which in this case we used braces, and with the presence of braces, the blocks can be arbitrary long, executes with the remappings given by the YAML block parameters. In this case, when we called plot function x, the code felt we were calling plot sign x, so not only do we get the calculation right, we also get the name of the function in the automatically produced axes label, just as before. And thank you. That's replier let, and that's my view on standard versus non-standard evaluation. Hopefully this is a tool you can add to your programming repertoire.